Hey, I'm R. Alvin Brooks. I am the host of this podcast. And I am Dele Johnson, editor and producer. So listen, uh, this episode we're talking to John Jennings. Uh, he, I said this when I met him, but basically he is everything that I do except with the volume turned up. <laughs> like he's a professor uh, at uh, UC Riverside, I believe. He writes and draws graphic novels. Uh, he has a New York Times bestseller graphic novel that he did. He has his pub own publishing imprint. And uh, his comic book pedigree is deep. We got into those conversations about some old heroes. We got we talked about golden age heroes, public domain heroes. We talked about obscure characters from the 80s. And I had this worry that uh, for people like you normals who are out there listening, that you like we got too deep in the weeds with the comic book <laughs> stuff. But uh, I hope I was able to keep it there, you know, because uh, clearly he and I could have just spent hours talking about that stuff because it's just yeah. cool when you find somebody who connects on that stuff yeah especially like another brother you know who's really deep into that stuff yeah um but i really did enjoy the conversation and i think that uh, anybody who's listening is going to enjoy it too absolutely and he is a common look like i think he could win a common look like <laughs> right. competition for sure he's he's got the look he's got the deep voice yeah uh, right the common swag yeah we'll I'll, let y'all be the the judges of that though in the video version it's true oh and also my uh sister and niece were visiting and so they were here and uh we cut it out but it, uh, you know i was fussing at them for making noise but eventually <laughs> they were quiet my niece is eight years old so it was very good for her to be quiet for that amount yeah of time. i think she did a great job right on. she definitely kind of tuned out at one point <laughs> yes jumped on the nintendo switch she did but... <laughs> right and that was like a, a new birthday gift so she was all the way in oh it. Yeah. okay <laughs> yeah yeah anyway you guys check it out uh make sure please that you uh, write reviews for this podcast that you share it with your friends spread the word it just Helps us out. I mean, we're in season three of this, and we would like more people to hear it. So anyone who's listening to it, please share it. Welcome to How Art is Born, a podcast from the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver about the origins of artists and their creative and artistic practices. I'm your host, R. Alan Brooks, artist, writer, and professor. Today I'm joined by a greater Los Angeles-based professor, author, graphic novelist, curator, and New York Times and New York Times bestseller, John Jennings. Say hello. Hello, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you being here, man. It's like uh, basically you are reading off, what you do is like reading off what I do, except crunk turned up a little <laughs> bit, you know? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so uh, how'd, you, how'd you get into comics to begin with, man? Like what was the beginning of your, you know, your love of this medium? It's my mom's fault. Totally my mother's fault. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in Mississippi, I was born in 1970, you know, so basically post-civil rights era Mississippi, you know. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, I grew up, let's just say I had humble beginnings, right? <laughs> let's just say that. <laughs> humble beginnings. Right. And uh, in the middle of, like, in the middle of the woods. I mean, I grew up, like, in a very isolated space. And, um, but I had my imagination. So I actually started reading at a very early age. And I was always, mm. like, mythology and folklore and stuff like that just fascinated by like just weird stories and stuff. I don't know. It was weird. Yeah. But my mom was a, she was an English major. She was a literature major at Alcorn State University. And so she okay. had a lot of her books around and stuff. So I started, I started reading pretty early and my mom mm. was trying to cultivate that, you know, like your dad, you know? Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, she saw the connection between like, Oh, the mighty Thor and like, Oh, he likes Norse mythology. He might like this kind of thing. Right. So uh, yeah. And that's kind of like why I started reading comics. Little did there was this uh did she know there was this I'm oh, sorry <laughs> there was this uh, independent black film in the in the nineties called Chameleon Street did you ever see that yeah yeah I yeah, own that that's great okay. yeah. oh yeah okay so you remember there was the brother uh, there's a scene where uh, the main character's in jail and he's talking to a brother and the brother's like yeah you know I was really into Thor back then because mm -hmm. he asked him how he got into jail and and uh, he, he said I came in the room and I said mother what have become of my comics. <laughs> 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 and that's how he ended up in jail. What happened? Come yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that's like, <laughs> we actually like you know everybody has like I, how, how I lost my comics story, right? Right. <laughs> so right. Yep. So sad. All right. So you got into it, man. So like, okay. So like for me, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my pops got me into it when I was like five, around ten. My mom was like, I saw this thing in the paper. Uh, it's a comic book convention. Would that be something you're interested in? <laughs> and I was like, Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. What? Why not? <laughs> right. And of course, I was, uh, this is in Atlanta. I grew up in Atlanta. So uh, yeah. around, I was, you know, I was around 10. She just dropped this off because it was the 80s. And uh, 
you know, comic conventions are maybe like 300 people. Uh, and I had one homeboy who was in the comics. So it was basically me and him was the only black people and the only kids. Hmm. Uh, did you get into that convention life early or was it just kind of like you read and doing your own thing? No, I didn't have as much access because, you know, like I, I'm always, I always lament the day the comics left, you know, because I, like I, said, uh, I grew up in a small agrarian farming community, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was, uh, you know, I would get my comics from say like spin racks and like newsstands. Right. You know? And then of course, you know, late seventies when the direct market happens, all that yeah. appears, you know, goes right. And, um, you can't get comics anymore. <clears throat> not, huh. not, not the way you used to. So you would have to go to a specialty shop, a direct, direct market. And the closest direct market store was called the star store. It was in Jackson, Mississippi, which is, you know, it might as, for me, it might as well be on the other side of the moon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, right. Yeah. So I didn't see comics like that for a while. And then, um, then here comes Eduardo. It's my Eduardo story. So okay. I had an uncle, he was an artist at the time. He's the one that actually started me drawing comics and stuff. He was in the, he was in the drawing cartoons and stuff, but he mm-hmm. was also, you know, dating a, a, a woman named Alice and she was hmm. nice. And she had a son around my age named Eduardo, you know? Okay. And Eduardo was a massive comic book fanatic and they lived in huh. Mississippi and they lived around the corner from the star store. So he literally huh. had thousands of comics. Wow. Right. And so what happened was, um, and this had to be like early eighties because I was thinking about the books that were, that he gave me. His mother right. was going to, uh, chameleon street <laughs> was going <laughs> was, was to get rid of, um, a bunch of his comics. So she was right. like, look, you need to get rid of some of these are everywhere. We don't have space for this. And he had been, you know, they would come out and visit. And so what happened was, um, we would play together and he would read comics and stuff. Yeah. And he knew that I'd take care of him. So he gave me at least five or 600 comics, dude. Wow. And I'm talking That's like, cool. I'm talking like stuff I had never seen before, like uh, right. like Grimjack, like <laughs> nice. the Strontium Dog. Like, wow. I'm like, I don't know who was buying him these comics. I, maybe he was just picking them up because of the covers or something. But I was like, his yeah. his taste in comics was eclectic. <laughs> it was like huh. phenomenal. And so it just, that actually, that whole collection carried my interest, you know, and, and changed the way I looked at comics, actually. Hmm. That's interesting. There's so many, there were so many independents in there because, uh, I missed a lot of those in the eighties because they cost more yeah. and they were black and white. And they were you know what white. Yeah. 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 So like I missed a lot. So I ended up catching a lot of those like on, you know, in, uh, you know, boxes in the nineties, I would pull them out and try. Yeah. And I was like, these are actually pretty good. But I just, you know, basically when I was, you know, in the eighties, my mom or my dad would be like, you got $20 or you got $40, whatever it is to spend. Yeah. And I would, you know, I'd be like, okay, can I get this one? No, I got to get rid of this one. You know, so like the independence, I was not trying to do it because they cost more. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I was thinking like, um, you know, you were you were in the bud plant uh catalogs. Yeah. yeah, so you you know, you you would uh you would wait a minute, I just thought about Denver. Isn't that what Maha Comics is? Are they still out? Yep. Yeah, okay. So for people who are listening who aren't familiar with this, uh every comic book in the eighties and nineties had a two page advertising spread of Maha Comics. Mm-hmm. And I, I was reading that in Atlanta. I knew what Maha Comics was before I knew what Denver was. Right. <laughs> when I moved here, it didn't occur to me that it was here. And I was just driving and I saw the sign and I was like, Maha Comics is here? That's right. And I called my homeboy. I was like, yo, Maha Comics. He was That's like, hilarious. No, it was, yeah. It was, it was so funny. Okay, I got to remind, I'm going to stick a, a fork in that one because I got I to gotta come back to that. So, um, but I was, I would get the catalogs and stuff from Bud Plant and Maha Comics and stuff. Yeah. And that's how I was keeping on top of what was coming. I couldn't afford them, you know. Right. But I was like, what is Love and Rockets? What is Watchmen? Right. You know, but I didn't get a chance to see those until much later. And to your initial question, which I never asked, I would answer it actually. I didn't get, my first comic book convention was way into my, I was like, it was Wizard World. It was, I think I was oh. know, out of grad school, actually. Wow. Yeah, it was okay. way late, you know. So it was like out in the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, well, Chicago land, actually, in Chicago. Right. Chicago. But my my, my comic story, story is this. I was in Denver for a either design conference or Amer- I mean, it was American Studies Association conference. And I was mm. in the cab, right? And I was and I was talking to the cabbie. And I was like, you know what? You guys have a really famous store here. It's called Maha Comics. He's like, what? I was like, yeah. I, I grew up like reading about this place. It's like, this is where it is. And I was talking right. about teaching him about his own city. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. He didn't know about the comic, didn't know about the comic world in the city. Exactly. 
Yeah, so uh, the one homeboy that I had it was in the comics. When he came out to visit me the first time, I was like, yo, so you want to see like Red Rocks, you know, like the Garden of the Gods? He was like, I want to see Mile High Comics. So, yeah. That was like the, the first thing he wanted to go to, you know? No, it's, I still to this day, like if I'm going to a, uh, um, you know, a new a new city, I try to figure out what yeah. comic shops are. I still do that. Yeah, I was in New Orleans and uh, I went into one uh, that was called More Fun Comics. And mm-hmm. I, I walked in, and I was like, yo, did you name this after the old DC series? And they were like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, nobody knows that. It's kind of like you know? the, uh, um, the Million Year Picnic in Boston, right? Huh. In Cambridge. We didn't, they named it after the story. I think it's a Ray Bradbury story. That was, uh, oh, that's, that's cool. It's black owned. It's a black owned uh, story, and it's in Cambridge. It's called, I work. and it's downstairs. You have, to, huh. you have to walk down until it's it's barely any room in it. But it's a great store. It's called the Million the Million Year Picnic. Is the name of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then I want to know, man, for you, uh, what was the point where you decided that you were going to create art? Like, was that at the same time that you got into comics, or was there a distinct moment where you were like, "This is the thing I'm gonna do"? You know, that's a good question. Um, I started making art. As a, at a very young age, you know, I was really mm-hmm. visual, visually oriented. Um, I was always attracted to symbols and colors and shapes from an early age, you know. Mm-hmm. And I started making images pretty, pretty, pretty readily. Um, I remember the, my first, like, <laughs> it was like the back of my hand. So I remember I told you, like, uh, my um, my mom bought me Thor, right? Yeah. So I think about three weeks after that, give or take. Uh, she had a re- she, my mom had a pretty dope like LP collection right and uh, okay so I actually remember like looking inside of one of her album covers like one of her albums and seeing the clean inside of it I said wait a minute there's white stuff in here like, this is like it's like it's like clean paper inside of the okay so I remember like tearing open one of the albums you know <laughs> going inside of the album cover I drew it like this yeah. really badly rendered Thor but it was a, it was like the best oldest red ink <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And she like lost it, but she was like, "Oh, you're just trying to draw." So then she started buying me paper to draw on and stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, or like finding it at work or whatever. So, um, so around around what age would that have been? Oh man, that had to be like, I don't know, like eight maybe. Okay, seven, eight. I don't know. It's, it's kind of trying to think about where I was living at the time. Right. But um, but I, I took the art pretty pretty easily. You know, I said mm. I, I entered into you know art like kids art competitions and yeah. I, I remember like drawing stuff for my dentist. You know, I had to draw this incredible Hulk for like his wall, stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it, it was. It wasn't that bad actually. Now I think about it, it was actually a pretty good rendering of of, the, of, of a salvage name of Hulk. You know, huh? And um, I remember the first types of. I, the, I think the first thing I start, started doing was like storytelling. Like, I, I really love stories of all kinds, mm-hmm. and I remember the first in first grade, <laughs> I did like bootleg Popeye cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yep, I did like bootleg Popeye stories, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and you know, I started like a lot of people. I started doing like knockoff characters. You know, like I had a right. called the Panther. <laughs> and <laughs> it was Tony Smith, the Panther, and he was like, but he was nice. really like, you know, Tony Stark and what in T'Challa, you know? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. His gold suit, but he had like a headband, like 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 Shang Chi. You know, <laughs> it was so <laughs> so ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, so uh, me and my homeboy that I mentioned earlier, like uh, we met in the town to give to class, so we would just see each other once a week. Yeah, and so every week we would come with whatever our new superhero designs were. Oh, there we go. And uh, and you know they were always derivative, like you're talking oh, yeah. about. But there was a very distinct period when we started reading Fem Force. Uh-huh. <laughs> we're going through puberty, like uh. I, don't, I still don't think I could show any of those designs that we did to, to my mother. Gem Force <laughs> is pretty, yeah. And that's from, yeah. from what, Pacific uh, Comics? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, it's really crazy because, you know, of late I've been really interested in, like, public domain characters. And a lot of those characters are public domain characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we're both in that uh, group, that Facebook that's group. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. But, yeah. That's- yeah, because, you know, I, I wrote uh, uh, Butterfly. Butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're working on something with Butterfly, right? I'm working on a Butterfly. Well, I'm 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 kind of I'm publishing a Butterfly story. I came up with like designs for, um, you know, uh, like a, a '80s and '90s version of her. You know, yeah. And uh, I pitched it to my imprint, and um, yeah. So we're, we're working with a, a young lady out of Chicago. That's cool. And uh, yeah, but it's an update. It's very different. You know, that's why I like yeah. about the public domain stuff. You can actually take the, the, that one character and just run with it in different directions. Right. And then I just heard my friend Colleen. Uh, What's Colleen's last name? 
I can't think. I can't remember what the little bit M is right now. She's gonna murder me. Anyway, <laughs> um, Colleen is gonna do a, uh, um, a another butterfly stuff for like an attack. Oh, dope. Version. Yeah. So you know, I, I love the fact that you can just kind of like remix the characters and run with other things. You know. I think there's something beautiful about that, uh, and I guess for people listening, Butterfly is the first uh, black female superhero yep. uh, that, that saw publication. But they she only lasted for two issues of an anthology book, and then uh, then that company went out of business, so she's public domain now. Funny thing with me with that story, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I told you I put out that first graphic novel in 2017. I was invited to do that Butterfly story for uh, a publisher that was supposed to be new at the time. And uh, I did it. Uh, Frank Fosco drew it. And then nothing. Mm. Never heard anything. Oh, wow. Um, And I was like, well, and it was one of the first stories I ever wrote. It was a cool story. Then, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, New Year's Eve, right before this year, the artist Frank was like, hey, it's going to be a backup in Savage Dragon. And I was like, for real? (laughs) (laughs) That, That thing I wrote six, seven years that's how I get an image comics. All right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I bought that issue because of your story. Oh, I appreciate I that. Follow, man. I don't follow Savage Dragon like that. I always like the character. I always like the. You know, uh, like, I mean, I never read it to be honest. With, you know, like it, <laughs> he uses a lot of public domain characters too. Like he's actually used like Daredevil and a few other. Public yeah, it's yeah. it's cool. Uh, now he and I are Facebook friends, and it's cool to see like his approach to comics. This is Eric Larson, the creator of Savage Dragon. But it's cool to see like uh, what he has to say about comics, his perspective and stuff like that. That's that's usually pretty interesting to me. Definitely. So, okay. Uh, I, I'm interested in this journey from being somebody who draws on the inside of uh, the album papers <laughs> <laughs> to becoming the person who you are now. Like, was it that uh, you, you, we talked earlier about you going to school. It didn't sound like it was for art specifically. It was. So, Oh, okay. So yeah, can you talk about like what your journey was and how you yeah, got here? Yeah, I actually um, ended up going to went to Jackson State for undergrad. Uh, okay, class of eighty no ninety three. Yep, eighty nine ninety three, and okay. I studied commercial art, which is the great granddaddy of graphic design. Right, right. And out of out of school, and I and actually while I was there, I did like uh, I was at school. I worked for the school newspaper, the Blue and White Flash. Huh. And I had my own little like cartoon strip and stuff. It's called Academia, you know. Nice. And uh, you know, it, it was fun, and people seemed to like it. Um, <clears throat> but then we have a local paper called the Clarion Ledger. Hmm. Clarion Ledger uh, is is a um, it's a Gannett paper. So you know, same. Oh, some people don't own. So my dad was with Gannett. He uh, yeah. worked. He was a uh, deputy managing editor for USA Today. Yeah, so for, the uh, USA Today and yeah, the Detroit News and. Uh, other big, other big papers. So it's a big paper. It was the biggest paper. Right. It's the biggest paper in Mississippi. Okay. And uh, what's really crazy about it is that at the time, all of the graphic designers and graphic artists were all black men. Huh. For reason, you know. Yeah. There's like three or four black men that worked in the art department, and they huh. did all the graphics work. They did design work. They did illustration work. And and the art director was a black man. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. <laughs> and so um, it it blew me away. And so. Um, they actually came to visit. That's how I knew about it. They came to visit the Blue and White Flash. It was like a career day kind of thing. Okay. And so I think after I showed them my work, they decided that they they had done like internships before with like news reporters and stuff. Right. right. But they had never done um, an art internship before. They huh. needed an intern and so internship. So they actually hired me as an intern and it was a paid internship. It was the most money I ever made. I think I was making close to $800 a week. Nice. And for me, out of college, being Poe, I was like, right. oh my goodness, I'm, I'm right. rich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh my God. It was kind of like, you know, but then, and, and, and I got a job with them right after, actually. And then, um, okay. but I didn't work there that long because I, I was interested in grad school. And so, I don't know, I, I liked working there. I, 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 it was good people. It was good pay for me at the time. Um, but I was really interested in education and uh, and, and just learning more, you know? So I ended up getting into graduate school um, for art education, actually, okay. in University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I did that. Uh, but while I was there, I took graphic design classes, and I fell in love with graphic design. So I actually ended up getting into their MFA program after hmm. three tries. It was very tough. Wow. Uh, got into the MFA program, and uh, I was only one of, let's see, it was 88 people uh, um, 
applied that year, five of us got in and only <laughs> three of us out of that class stuck in it. So it was, it was wow. stringent. Yeah. And, um, I ended up doing well there and then I ended up, uh, there's a, there was a local like software company that was started by a, um, this genius level, like computer programmer guy, you know, cause mm. at the time, you know, U of I was like a really big, like hub for computer programming, super computing. Okay. I mean, the first internet browser uh, was created there. Mosaic was created there. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so, um, and of course, Mosaic later becomes Fire, uh, Firefox and, Oh no, fi- no, not Fire. Is it Firefox? <laughs> I use Firefox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those, those. Yeah. So, and then now he's like multi-billionaire and philanthropist, you know. But he started as okay. a grad student at um, I forgot his name at a U of I. Anyway, so mm-hmm. uh, I worked at Stephen Wolfram's company, Wolfram Research. Uh, okay. I was doing packaging design, so I was still like full-time grad student, but also had a full-time wow. job. <laughs> and. Um, it was good. And I was doing packaging design and stuff like that. And then what happened was I fell in love with teaching, man. I really would thought about teaching. And uh, at the time I had gone through like a really big breakup and, uh, you know, with someone I thought was going to be my wife, but wasn't. Right. <laughs> and I needed a reset. And what happened? Yeah. My old um, my mentor at Jackson State reached out and said, hey, we got an opening for a graphic design professor. And I was like, oh. hmm. Uh okay well I I do the designs <laughs> so, right right so like I applied for it got it and uh, taught there for four years I built graph the, their graphic design program pretty much from the bottom up you know huh uh, designed the, the Jackson State University logo stuff like that I worked there wow. and I helped build got got NASA accreditation uh, huh you know, redesigned their uh, curriculum <laughs> <which, laughs> pretty- you was in there all right yeah yeah I was up to the eyeballs and then. But I really got to segue into comics again until, like, I go back to, because I get hired away. Like, my other alma mater, University of Illinois, hires me right. to, 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 to beef up their image making uh, side of things, right? Because I'm doing, like, a lot of image making. And that's okay. when I came back to comics. Huh. And I had to be, like, the early 2000s. So what I did is I gave up. Don't give up. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, because what happened was, like, I was looking at, I was a decent artist, but I wasn't drawing, like, you know, I didn't, I, I really didn't see myself be, doing it. You know, for for a living, and so what ends up happening? Yeah, like that house style. Yeah, the house like style. I wasn't the house style. Comments. I'm really, yeah, I'm really influenced by fine art. So my hand looks like you know, uh, Franz Masaryk or, or like Otto Dix. You know, right? You know, Palmer Hayden. You know, what I'm saying I had that kind of feel in my hand. You know, and it's some mm. cool comic stuff too. But I really don't come back to comics until the early 2000s, and hmm. uh, I was really interested in like web comics and like different formats of comics. Yeah, and so what happened was is like I'm fiddling around with. Uh, you know, web comics and doing like other types of formats and stuff. And I come across Lulu, hmm. the self publishing, you know, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. on demand company, right? right. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm trained as a book designer. So let me get this straight. So I can actually make a book and put it out myself. Hmm. Sign me up. So I started doing independent publishing. And that's when I met okay. Ian Duffy, who was also doing independent publishing. And yeah. We did this book called The Whole consumer culture back in the day. I had to point out that you both have alliterated names like every good comic book hero. Yeah, that's so right. it seems like a perfect match. match. That's right. We're perfect match. We actually call us a right. J- J2D2, actually. <laughs> nice. Yeah, J2D2. And um, so then what happened was uh, we did the whole, we were making this book, <laughs> this crazy cultish, like, you know, voodoo inspired critique of racism in America, you know, huh. off, the, off the chain, crazy. And we yeah. actually got a publisher for it. Oh, nice. Yeah. This, they're out of, they're our friend, now friend, Doug Fogelson, he's a photographer. And uh, I met him because of a student of mine, did some work for a friend of his or something like that. And he mentioned me and I ended up writing something for another book. And we just kept in touch. And I was sharing images of the whole with him. He's like, you know what? Come to Chicago. Let's have a meeting. I was like, okay. So me and Damien went up to Chicago and uh, talked to him and his par- partners. And I said, okay, we're going to do it. And we're like, mm. do what? <laughs> and they were like, oh, we're going to publish your book. And we're like, wow. Are you serious? <laughs> this crazy thing? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And that's how I started off in like, that was my first major published work, actually. Right. And uh, after that, of course, we did um, we did some we, we did some curatorial work. We did this show called Out of Sequence, uh, mm-hmm. Underrepresented Voices in American Comics. Both of us are comic scholars. And so we were like, well, if we can't work in comics, at least we can have be comics adjacent, you know? Right, right. And, uh, so we started studying comics as a medium, and then we put together an art show, two art shows, actually. One was called Other Heroes, 
which is at Jackson State. Hmm. And the other one was in uh, at, at U of I. This is like early 2000s, like 2007, 2008, you know. Okay. <clears throat> and then what happens is, um, you know, we started talking to this company called Mark Batty Publisher. And they're, again, defunct, you know. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, they just... You know, like Front 40, they, they really had ambi- like a lot of ambition, but they were, did these really beautiful niche books that people weren't buying. They were gorgeous books, but people oh. were like not buying them, you know. Huh. <clears throat> and so, but what, what they published are, that's the black com- the first black comics book. Okay, and, yeah. And so that's that's what really put us on the map. That's actually the book that got us the Kindred deal. Right? Huh. Yep. I got one of the Kickstarter editions of yeah, that. Yeah, that's the second. Yeah. That's the follow-up. Okay. Yeah, the first one's out of print, been out of print for years. You know? Wow. Yeah, because the company went out of business. <laughs> it was kind of interesting because, um, and I think this happened in when I was still when I was at Buffalo. Because what happened was, the company went out of business. Um, we had earned royalties, right? But they didn't pay us royalties because they were not solvent enough. So they paid us in books. Huh. So they so yeah so they paid us in books. They gave us like a ton of books. And you know what else they did? Because they said like they said to us like if all the books sold as well as your books would, we'd still be a business right now. Huh. So what they did was instead of liquidate the books, they actually sold um, the books to all the contributors, which is like 50 people. Wow. At a severe discount. I'm talking like right. $2 a book. Huh. We're talking about a $45 book. Wow. So people were able to actually make a mint off those books. We're talking about, so, so people loved that. They were like, wait a minute. So you, we can buy these books for two dollars a piece and sell them for forty. Right. That's like for real publishing, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. Right. You know. So yeah. So that's, huh. that was really interesting. And then you know, after the Kendrick book, though, um, uh, we managed to pull that out. People liked it. You know. Uh, I, did, I think I drew that in about eight months or so. Uh, there's there's okay. more getting to the, the rigmarole around that, but uh, the book was a hit. The book was a hit, and uh, yeah, still sells well. Um, Good. Debuted at number one on the, on, the, on the New York Times bestseller list for comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, won the uh, Bram Stoker Award. Won the Eisner Award. Uh, and other awards, you know. And nice man. And then we we're actually able to do more stuff with the Octavia Butler, um, you know, uh, estate. For those of you who don't know, uh, you know, Octavia Estelle Butler is like one of the the most beloved science fiction writers uh, ever. Right. And she's a black woman. And she's from Pasadena, yep. California, and she's the first science fiction writer to win a MacArthur Genius Grant, you know. And, um, you know, she died in 2007, I believe, actually. Hmm. You know, so we've been working with her estate, and uh, we're working on Parable of Talents now, actually, finally. Okay. But what happened was that actually gave us the leverage to actually start working in comics a lot more uh, huh. as creators, and that's how I ended up getting an imprint at Abrams because the book was so successful that they were like, yo, this is, this is a viable space for us. And so, you know, yeah. I love that, man. It's really cool to hear all that. Yeah. I want to say there was a period, like uh, I might've been 12. My dad was like, it's time for you to read Octavia Butler now, Mm -hmm. you know? And he hit me with like a couple of the paperbacks. Oh yeah. Uh, I love, you know, I'm constantly talking with people about, particularly when it comes to like publishing or comics, Figuring out how, like how to masterpiece these fools, right? Because and just like do my thing, right? Uh, in such a way that because like if I were waiting on you know if I were waiting on people, I would still be selling insurance, like you know. Yeah. So figuring out how to make a living doing the thing you love. Yeah. Um, which I'm fortunately in that position and just looking to like how to expand it. I love that all of this came from you doing something that was something you loved in the way that you loved. Mm-hmm. Like you, you didn't like take this project to Marvel or DC, you know. Like you just created the thing that you loved and moved forward with it. Yep. And you've been able to reap some of these cool benefits. That's really cool to hear. No, no, seriously. And like, first of all, Marvel or DC would not have ever published this doll. <laughs> right. Right. It's crazy, and uh, it's a crazy <laughs> book. Um, but you know, people have written about it. People have done dissertations about it and stuff. Huh. Because you know, it's well researched in it, but it's like you know. But it's this crazy satire horror. It's, it's very much for adults. It's not for adults. right. It's very like NC seventeen. You know, it's pretty wild. Um, <laughs> but it also is talking about black bodies and racism and voodoo and de- demonization mm-hmm. of African uh, belief structures, stuff like that. Yeah, and, um, they wouldn't publish that. <laughs> not like they take ideas anyway. 
I mean, they, they right. just publish uh, stuff that they're doing. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that after a while, I became known as a, a scholar of race and comics, you know? And, okay. Uh, became a pun identified that people knew that I was a, cur- a curator and, and knowledgeable to a certain degree. Right. These subject matters. And I actually ended up working. Um, actually, uh, Marvel reached out to me, you know, and yeah. said, hey, you know, we want you to write a piece for our site uh, for this Marvel Marvel's Voices piece, you know. Huh. It was called Lift Every Voice. Right. A short piece about diversity, the importance of diversity in comics and how Marvel has always been thinking about diversity, you know, writ large. Yeah. And uh, that segued into, like, hey, he did a great job on that. Unless they hired me to write the introduction to the re-issue uh, of uh, God Loves, Man Kills by uh, okay. Chris Claremont, right? Nice. And That's that's actually, I didn't know that. That's, that's really huge, wonderful. It's a huge deal. And like the new book, yes, yeah, you know, so they hired me to do that. And then what happened was um, they were like, hey, you know, we want you to you to write a book about our black superheroes. Huh. Like, what? <laughs> so a massive, you know, history book about their black characters from 1950 to current day. Okay. Yep. It's called My Superhero yes. Black. Me and my friend Angelique Roche, who helps run the Mar- Marvel's Voices. I'm familiar with her work, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we were working on a book together. We were working for two years on it. And, uh, huh. Yeah, and we almost done. We were close. You know, uh, she's been insanely... I mean, I can't, I can't think of a better partner. So basically what happens is I write badly, and then she makes it better. <laughs> And more worthy to be published because <laughs> what happened over the pandemic is that you know uh, we had a lot of losses my sister passed my Sorry son, do, man. thank you my son was uh diagnosed with autism at two huh. and so that was a huge shift we moved actually to another place she okay. moved there's been a lot of distractions and stuff and uh right also too the thing is is that when you start getting into the nitty-gritty of a book like that you yeah. realize like all the trips and, and pitfalls and tributaries that you go down. We're talking about eighty mm-hmm. years of continuity, right? With a company that really at at first was not even thinking about archiving anything, <laughs> so, right? Right. Yeah. So if you look at like nineteen fifties, people were using different names, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pseudonyms, pseudonyms right? and stuff. You they were like ashamed to writing in comics, right? Yeah. And then you also had like um, them starting issues like later, like oh, it's not issue one, it's issue eight. Like, wait, what? no, where's the rest of it? You know, it's just kind of, right, right, right. So it was kind of crazy. Huh. So what ends up from that is that I've come across this character called Al B. Harper, who's a yeah. surfer character. And, um, you know, he sacrifices his life to save the planet. And the Silver Surfer puts a cosmic flame on his grave to mark him as a hero for all eternity. Hmm. And in the middle of, the, you know, George Floyd protests and the loss of my sister, the loss of Chadwick Boseman. Yeah, you know Brianna Taylor's, you know, loss. Right. People in the streets. The world is on fire. I was like, well, I feel like Stan Lee wrote a Black Death Matter story because essentially, you know, it's about a, a character who selflessly sacrifices his life. A black character. This is 1969, right. a year after you know MLK is assassinated, and uh, I think Stan Lee wanted to have a conversation about race and civil rights. You know, and he uses black right. man as a martyr to a certain degree to, to do that. You know. Mm-hmm. And so when I was looking at the character, I was like moved by it. And I was like, you know what? I don't want him to be dead anymore. Hmm. I, I, I want him to be alive. I want him, I want him to, I think he'll be more helpful to us if he were a superhero. So I pitched huh. him to Marvel because I had their ear because of the other book. And they were like, right. tell us more. And I was like, well, I would do this. Thing. <laughs> I would do this, 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 and this. And then they were like, tell us more. And I was like, okay, here's 40 page, you know, pitch. <laughs> Nice. Way too much, by the way. <laughs> um, they asked more. Yeah, they did. So I went in, <laughs> and they were like, "All right, five issues." And I was like, "Excuse me, five? What? 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 Like, here's five right. issues. Tell us about your new black superhero. Let's do it." And I was like, "Excuse me, what?" So yeah, so that's so now I've been writing for Marvel for, and I created a new black superhero based off of a Stan Lee character. I love that man with cosmic powers. No, less. right. Right. Uh, so people can pick this up too. I, yeah, I mean, it's Silver Surfer Ghostlight. That's correct. Or is, yeah, and uh, the trade. What is the trade comes out in September? Uh, okay. Yeah, it's Dope. five issues, and uh, the issue four drops end of the month, and then issue five in June, in like late June. So. so has it been significantly different uh, from the other work you've been doing to to do like a like a monthly Marvel comic? Yes. Like, 
All right. <laughs> yeah, how so? Well, I mean, of course, the deadlines are very different, right. right? And the process that they have is very, very, I mean, it's, 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 um, they have it down to a science. Uh -huh. It's, it's, um, it's immediate. Like, so for instance, like, you know, you have, you know, it depends on the team, the team that they pick, they, they move differently. Uh, our artist is Valentin Delandro. Uh, mm -hmm. he was a, you know, Trinidadian, uh, artist out of, uh, oh, okay. out of, uh, Toronto. And, hmm. you know, our, our cover artist is a black man as well, Taryn Clark. And, uh, yeah, it's been really an interesting conversation between the three of us working on his character. So, um, you know, first you get the first draft in, right? Right. Then they get notes on that. And then you do a dialogue pass, which means like you go back and you double check to make sure that, you know, they're saying what they need to be saying. Uh, uh, they get that on top of the inks, the letters, you know, so you, so you see the lettered proof. Yeah. Right. And then you get the colors in, right. And you have to give notes on the colors and then you right. the final pass on the dialogue with everything. And then it goes to press. And that happens huh. every month. <laughs> so and it's very wow. fast. It happens very fast. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that, man. I I don't know. I just it's really cool hearing about I don't know, just your journey. Now I, I wanna ask like so uh I hosted a previous comic podcast where I talked to just different people who are in the geek world and I, I talked to like um Alan Davis and I talked to um Azarello, Brian Azarello. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with each of them about this idea about um, whether art is for sort of making people think differently about their lives or whether it's for escapism. Mm. And I, I think both are equally valid. Alan Davis was more on the like, it lets me escape the world. Azarello was more on the like, I can change people's lives if I can make them think differently, you know? Yeah. And I, I wonder where you are, like when you're creating. Um, what do you have in mind? What effect do you want it to have on people, the world, et cetera? I am. I'm very much in Azarello's camp, you know? Yeah. And I think it's because I'm really influenced by like, <clears throat> not pop culture, you know, but, but it's influenced by black arts movements, you know? Yeah. So I'm talking about like, you know, the Harlem Renaissance and, and the right. black arts movement, Afrocopra, what you want to call the black speculative arts movement, right? Mm -hmm. Where like black people in our country have always, uh, used art to fight against oppression, you know? Right. Whether it's dance, poetry, what have you, you know, uh, it seems ingrained in us. And also to work like, you know, Emory Douglas, you know? And yeah. if you look at like uh, the different theoretical framings from, from black scholars around black art, a lot of it is about like use art to fight, right? So mm -hmm. Look at like the criteria of Negro art by Du Bois. He's like, he doesn't yeah. even care about work that isn't propaganda. <laughs> He's like, right, right. as long as we're not free, we don't have to use art to tell you, to tell you what we need, right? Um, but then another one is uh, Bell Hooks' uh, Black Static, Strange and Oppositional. You know, mm -hmm. make the artwork strange and oppositional. Push back mm -hmm. against the norm, right? Fight from the margins. That's her. That's Bell right. Hooks. Um, then you also have like you know what was it the, the Crisis of Negro Artists on the, in the, no in the Racial Mountain? You know that piece by um, no. Langston Hughes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I'm looking at these forefathers. Oh, and uh, right. you know, Emory Douglas also, and foremothers. Emory Douglas has a has a ten point you know manifesto about art. You know, make it clear, mm. make it you know, make it provocative, make it easy to understand. So when I look at comics, I love them, but they also speak very symbolically. You can actually talk about a lot of different you know types of political issues and issues that are affecting our people right. readily. So even with something like Ghostlight. One of the most radical things I could have done is I gave that brother a family, right? You know, because in the first, the first when you see ghosts like me, or Al Harper, um, he's just in the woods. He's created to as a plot point for a civil circle. right? But I give him a backstory. I give him emotions. I give him affect. I give him like complexity. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, to me that was a bless. I'll, I'll I'll always be grateful to Marvel for letting me do that because that mm -hmm. is such a radical thing to see. You know. Even yeah. even in this day and age where you get like complexity, you know, we are not a monolith, you know, these types. Of things. Right. That's something I think is really important. So, yes, I'm very much in the camp like art can change people's minds, you know, hmm. and 
they do it every day. You know, we just call it commercial art. Like you look at like advertisers and stuff, they're using art to sell us things all the time. Right. So how, why can't we sell like, hey, let's talk about climate change or, hey, why don't we, why don't we end abuse, uh, abuse against like the elderly, elderly and women and children, right? Right. Why don't we think more equity, equitably about like, you know, the bottom line about prison industrial complex? Why can't we talk about these things with our art? Hmm. You know? I love that, man. You know, so for me uh, as a child of the Twilight Zone and civil rights, yep. you know, <laughs> uh, like those things coming together, it's always it's always on my mind, you know, uh Sort of Rod Serling and Melvin Van Peebles, you yep. know, are like <laughs> kind of had top influences for me. And I, it it does come out, you know, and it's interesting how um, when you have those people who who something that you create resonates in a powerful way, mm-hmm. like you can you can see the way that it's changed their lives. You can feel yes, like and and they're like happy. Like it's just a really interesting experience to have somebody who is significantly impacted by characters i made up on my couch hey, <laughs> do you know what I'm i know saying? right it's like yeah you just kind of doodling and yeah connect with it you know that's that is a i'll never get over that you're, you're absolutely right like hey i'm just i wrote this story about this character this, like like even with your butterfly story right so taking that character from you know the public domain because yeah. a mishap because really what it was they, they didn't put the copyright symbol on it probably yeah a mishap right right well, you can actually now empower others and yourself with this character Right. So, yeah, it's so amazing to me. Um, the other thing, too, is like, you know, I do a lot of work with um, community centers to create black comic book festivals. Right. Hmm. So, like, I co-founded the, um, the Black Comic Book Festival in Harlem. I want to co-found mm-hmm. that. And it's the largest black comic book festival in the country, probably in the world, even maybe as far as I can tell. OK. Um, Pre-COVID, we're talking 12, 15,000 people huh. to a free two day event. At the Schomburg Center for Research of Black Culture, yeah, on Lenox Avenue, also known as Malcolm X Boulevard, right, right, uh, across from the Harlem Hospital, down the street, around the corner from Apollo, right, Red Roof huh. across the street, the Har- you know, it's just black, blickety black, right, yeah, this right, is the repository of the Harlem Renaissance, man, like mm. St. Hughes's ashes are buried in the foundation, like literally, in our- wow, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that, yeah. So this is this is where like Harry Belafonte and like Ozzy Davis and Ruby D perform in the basement, man. <laughs> huh. Yeah, this so this is like a piece of history. And they said, Hey, let's do a black comic book festival. Whew. Man. That's so cool. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like kids walking into that space and seeing themselves reflected back at them at themselves and then like everybody there is making something that's for them. Right. You know? And and for that hmm. for two days, we are the default. Huh. No, it's nothing like it. <laughs> so, I love that man. You know, I gotta say, I listen, brother. It's it's easy to talk to you, and oh, uh, and I'm enjoying it. But uh, I guess we're gonna head towards wrapping up. There's three things. One, I want to ask, uh, in your process, yeah, when you feel fear, uh, when you feel fear, first of all, what what how does it manifest, and then secondly, how do you get through it? Okay, um, so. It's, it's interesting because I'm a horror creator too. So I, I, I yeah. so fear is my medium to a certain degree. Huh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm actually the first African-American man to win the Bram Stoker Award. Huh. And people don't realize that. Uh, but yeah, I was the first. Uh, Linda Addison, you know, who's a horror poet. She's written one yeah. a bunch. She's a black woman. She's the first black person. Okay. First black man to win one. And uh, it's, wow. it's for Kindred. And so I've always been a big horror fan. So this notion of fear. Uh, is something that I really, really think about a lot because a lot of times mm-hmm. I'm trying to scare you with my stories, <laughs> right? But for a good reason, I'm actually trying to use them to use the fear or the anxiety that I have. It's it's fuel for the work, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of times I'm making like Octavia Butler, like I'm really influenced by what she wanted to do, like with, with Parable of the Sword, like she wanted to create warnings about the future. Mm-hmm. And I want to say like that fear has become more intense after becoming a father. You know, uh, um, the Afro future has shifted a greatly, you know, when I look at like the world that Jackson, by the way, my son's name is Jackson Kirby, by the way. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, you, you're on that, uh, that Nick Cage level. Yes. You know, he named his son kal Oh, I didn't realize that. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Well, that, yep. That's it. my mom. I mean, my mom, 
just for you. So my wife, <laughs> my wife uh, uh, named him that, uh, and uh, yeah, it's kind of oh, that's... because um, we spell it J J X O N, and so my okay. my grandfather uh, couldn't read or write, and he signed his name hmm. X. So we kind of okay. did it after my grandfather on the slide too. So that's dope. Thanks. Uh, okay, okay. It reminds me of a joke from Cheers that I just got to throw out because okay. I just listened to a podcast from Cheers. Okay, somebody asked uh, Cliff Clavin, the mailman character, they were like, uh, "What is a Freudian slip?" And he says, "It's when you say when you mean to say one thing and you accidentally say a mother." <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> anyway, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's really right. So beautifully nerdy. So anyway, so so fear is part of my process because yeah. And I don't shy away from it. I'm used to dealing with my my anxieties, and I use art to deal with them. Um, hmm. So, climate change has become something I'm very, very conscious about. So, I created an entire storytelling space when I, I was a Harvard fellow, and I did a I was work with Skip Gates and them, and I did like a okay. It's called the Cyber Trap. It's like a storytelling space, and it's set in huh. the future where like climate change devastates like the Southeast, you know. Hmm. And uh, Florida is totally submerged underwater. Everybody moves into the inland. You know, they have these big mega cities, stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I was kind of using uh, climate data and the fear of like what can happen if we don't pay attention to it to actually tell stories and actually, but as warnings, you know. Okay. So yeah, so I'm I'm I like the fears that I have go into the work because I want to deal with the issues. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's dope. You do a lot of interesting stuff. I feel obviously we just only scratched the surface, but it's really cool. I, I encourage anyone who's listening or watching to to look more into the work you've done. Thank you. All right, my two final questions are: uh, first, do you have any like what do you have going on next? Uh, where can people find your stuff? How can they engage with it? That kind of thing. Okay, um, so a good place to start is my website, which is uh, John Jennings Studio, all one word dot com. John Jennings Studio. Com. All right, so currently uh, I'm finishing up <clears throat> the five issue miniseries Silver Surfer Ghost Light, which I said introduces a brand new black superhero to the Marvel Universe and his family. Exciting. That will be collected September 26th, I think is when it comes together. Um, I just, I just uh, signed a contract with Vault Comics to do a new creator owned piece. Congrats. Uh, thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, are you gonna uh, write and draw? Are you gonna have somebody else writing? Yeah, I'm just gonna. Write. Okay. I found like when I have a kid, like drawing with the kid has been difficult. Like for instance, uh, another project I'm working on is Parable of Talents, which is a 280 uh, page book, right? Which is way overdue, and uh, <laughs> way way overdue. Um, me and my friend David Bram are gonna tackle the art. I'm gonna do finishes. He's gonna do breakdowns. So okay, give me a hand to catch up with that. So, yeah, I pretty much only uh, draw when it's an opportunity that I can't afford to have an artist mess up my deadline. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So like the couple of museum pieces I've done, it's only because, yeah, because it's a lot of work. It I respect com people who consistently draw good comics and and hit their deadlines. Exactly. I don't know how they do it. It's a brilliant thing. People like Rob Guillory, you know, or like right. David. Um, I got mistaken for him at a convention once. You know speaking what? Speaking of people. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I can see that. I can see it. <laughs> Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, Rob is cool people. Let's see. So um, the other thing too is the, the I'm uh, my superhero's black book. Which if we it looks like we're on track to get it done by the end of August. Uh, okay, that means it will be in stores next year uh, around okay. around Juneteenth. The Simon and Schuster and Marvel, right? Nice. The compendium of characters from Marvel, of color, you know, black characters from 1950 current day. And uh, so those are some of the bigger things. And uh, I'm in a collection of horror stories with some other brothers. We got a big Kickstarter. We got like a you know 52k for a Kickstarter. Okay. Those of y'all who are watching, who, who contributed, thank you. Um, but it's like a, a black horror anthology. Dark Horse is going to put it out for us. And so nice. And the last thing is a second volume of Box of Bones. There's other stuff, but I just want to you know those are some of the bigger things that are immediate right now. So yeah. Oh, oh, that sounds cool. Oh, no, one more. Okay. I, I, I'm okay. about this. I, I, I co edited a collection of Marvel comics for kids called Marvel Super Stories. Ah, that was nice. Fun. 15 artists. One of them huh. was me. 
I had a Daredevil story for kids. And in the, ah, and Daredevil was your favorite hero. We yeah, established exactly. that at the beginning. Has to do a Daredevil story, but for kids, it's so awesome. So, yep. Congrats, man. Congrats on all the stuff you're doing, man. Uh, all right. Well, then uh, the last thing I want to ask is, uh, what's inspiring you these days? Like, what are you into? Like, you know, is it music? Is it comics? Like, is there a specific thing yeah. that's inspiring you creatively? So, um, I'm always listening to music. I love music. Um, so yeah, music is always on. Oh, I don't think about it. Uh, I'm really inspired by uh, alternative histories right now, like speculative histories. Huh. You know, like thinking about like what could have happened and you know right. these fiction stories like how did we actually deal with things that could have happened and, and spaces that might have been you know hmm. um i was part of a a, a, co- of a a committee for hannah beekler's uh, uh afrofuturist period room she has at the met right now hannah beekler um for those of y'all don't know she was she's the oscar winning uh set designer for black panther world of wakanda uh hmm. i mean wakanda forever and um it's an alternative history Rome. So I became like really fascinated by the notion huh. of, well, what types of things, well-researched alternative histories has been really a thing. And like yourself, I'm really, I'm really like public domain characters too. Yeah. Because it's sort of a reclamation to me of a, of a mm-hmm. bygone her- a history. And it's also a critique. Like I, I make a lot of my characters of color, or, or I change gender or, you know, stuff like that. Because traditionally, as you know, like the superhero genre has been really, really about straight men, straight men and power fantasies, right? Yeah. You were not ever meant to be. Straight white men specifically. Exactly, yep. Yeah. So um, I like the idea of twisting those because that actually critiques the work, you know? Hmm. And uh, I'm really into that. And um, I don't know. So those, those are some of my little quirky things. But uh, I'm really inspired by, you know, meta narratives and, and looking at, like, you know, other histories and things, you know? Hmm. Brother John Jennings, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, especially given all the things that you got going on. Do you know what I'm saying? So busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you making it happen. No, no, it's my pleasure. Special thank you to today's guest, John Jennings. Thank you to the listeners. If you're not already, please be sure to subscribe to How Art Is Born wherever you get your podcasts for more episodes. And if you can, leave a review. It really helps us out. Check out MCA Denver on YouTube and subscribe to the channel to watch the video version of this podcast and get behind-the-scenes clips from today's episode. Visit MCA Denver's upcoming exhibitions. I'm going to try that word again. Visit MCA Denver's upcoming exhibitions. Tomashi Jackson, Across the Universe. Anna Sularkis, Indigenous Absurdities, opening Wednesday, June 14, 2023. How Art is Born is produced and edited by Dele Johnson and executive produced by Courtney Law. Additional thanks to Rachel Grammis for their work on marketing support for this episode.